So some of you have heard me share a, a story about uh, what happened after I became a Christian. Uh, but I became a Christian in college, and uh, even though I'd grow, grown up in a Christian home, I, I hadn't really understood what it meant for Jesus to be the King and the Lord of my life. And then in college, I truly encountered God uh, in a moment where He revealed His sovereignty to me. And He showed me how intricately He was in control of everything in my life, not only my uh, good circumstances and bad circumstances, but also the good things about my personality in addition to the bad things. God had purposed all those things to point to one foundational truth, that He is God, that He is sovereign over all things. Now, becoming a Christian is a process of rebirth, right? We, that's why we call ourselves born again. We are using the, the language of Scripture, specifically Jesus, when He talks about what happens when someone believes and is spiritually renewed in their faith in Christ and His gospel. So as a newborn, you have to learn things, right? As part of growing up and developing as a human being is about learning things However, I had gotten to a point uh, in, in my walk with the Lord, it was about a year or two into my time as a Christian, where I realized that I really didn't know anything about what having a healthy relationship with, uh, with a woman or female looked like. I had no idea what, what to think of it. And part of that realization was God and the Holy Spirit really showing me that everything that I had learned up to that point, how to deal with uh, romantic interest, how to um, date, how to what to think about marriage, what to think about, you know, all these things, just how to even perceive the opposite gender. Um, all of these things I had, I had learned from the world. I hadn't learned them from God. I hadn't learned them from the church or from the scriptures. I had learned these things through music videos, right? Through movies, through TV shows. These were the things that had educated me and ingrained in my mind all these useless and flawed ways of how to view just females in general. And this wasn't just about romantic interest. This didn't dawn upon me because I was interested in someone. It was just something that I realized that I didn't even know how to have friendships with females. Now, not everybody is in that, that state, but one thing that was so clear to me in that moment was that I needed to relearn everything. I needed to relearn how to think about women and girls and females, and I need to relearn from God and His Word what it means to have relationships as a male with other females, whether they be friends, or whether they be uh, romantic interests. And the question we're asking today uh, has a lot to do with that. The question we're asking today is, what do I need to unlearn as a Christian? Because as Christians, there, is, there are plenty of things that we must learn about God, how to walk with God, but... We must simultaneously be unlearning the things that we have been conditioned and trained in by the world. And unless we unlearn those things, we will not see the need for us to relearn or to learn something new from the first time from God himself. So to answer the question in a general sense, what do I need to unlearn as a Christian? The short answer is everything. Right? You need to unlearn everything meaning that everything you know from top to bottom should be based on God and His Word, right? What we believe about the universe, what we believe about the value of human life, what we believe about relationships, family, government, society, community, nature, all these things need to be unlearned so that we can learn from God Himself and His Word how to truly understand these things. But I also understand that just saying uh, you need to unlearn everything is not that helpful either. <laughs> just to say, oh, you need to unlearn everything. Get rid of everything. You know, it's like one of those mattress commercials, right? Forget everything you know about mattresses. And then they try to teach you about mattresses and try to tell you to buy their mattress for five easy payments of something 99, right? This isn't like that. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to do with today's message. But I do want to specifically highlight 
maybe the most important thing we need to unlearn as Christians in order for us to walk faithfully with God, in order for us to actually pursue holiness. And this thing that I want to highlight has to do with how we orient ourselves in our perception of reality. Among all things, the way of Satan, and as a result of Satan being in in dominion of the world apart from Christ, the ways of the Satan and the world is that it teaches us to orient our reality with ourselves in the center. Right? And in short, this is called self-centeredness, right? You guys all have heard that term before, self-centeredness. And it's very rarely, almost never used in a positive way, right? When you say, man, you're being so self-centered, that, it, that isn't a compliment, right? We understand just inherently that being self-centered isn't a great thing. However, however, we are continually communicated trained and conditioned by the world to live in self-centered ways. We're we're taught that we ought to identify our desires, identify our wants, our dreams, identify our inclinations, and then orient the rest of our lives around those things. That is self-centeredness. We are called to make a big deal out of our past and our future, out of our feelings. And these are supposed to inform how we think, how we feel, and how we behave in everyday life. Humanistic, self-centered thinking is what we are trained and conditioned to do from childhood in this world. However, this traces back to the deception of Eve in the Garden of Eden. God had told Adam and Eve very specific things. But the deception that ultimately caused Eve to sin and then caused Adam to sin was when Satan convinced Eve that the fruit that God had told them not to eat of was pleasing to the eye, was good for food, and beneficial for wisdom. The devil wants us to be self-centered in our thinking, in our feeling, and our actions, rather than being centered around God and His Word. This is at the core of our broken condition as sinners. And this is so ingrained in us that throughout our whole lives on earth as Christians, even though we are born again, we will be constantly struggling to unlearn these self-centered ways. And this is a valuable struggle to have, even though we won't achieve perfection out of our hard work, or no matter how long we try. It is going to be Christ who completes the work of sanctification, of making us holy. And there's great joy in that. But it is so ingrained in our thinking in our feelings, and our actions, that this is the scary part. We're usually blind to our own self-centered tendencies. We are usually blind to it. We don't even realize we're doing it. We don't even realize it. And that all points to the truth that we are broken, that we are sinners in our core, and that we need to be renewed. We need to pursue holiness. We need to be reshaped and transformed by the Holy Spirit of God and His Word. The central idea in today's text is that a self-centered lifestyle leads to blindness and bondage. A self-centered lifestyle leads to blindness and bondage. And that is ultimately one of the big takeaways from Samson's story. Out of the many things Samson was, more so than him being a strong man, The more glaring characteristic we can see from Samson is that he is overwhelmingly self-centered. He's all about himself. He's all about himself. And ultimately, what can we learn from his example of self-centeredness? We can see that it results in blindness, both spiritual and physical in his case, and bondage 
both spiritual and physical in Samson's case. However, many of us will not experience the same physical blindness, yet we have the same spiritual blindness. Most of us will not experience physical bondage as Samson does in today's story, but we do experience spiritual bondage. What must we do with this? Here is a sermon in a sentence. That you must unlearn your self-centered ways and learn the way of Christ in being a living sacrifice. You must unlearn your self-centered ways, the ways that the world teaches you to live, the way that Satan deceives us to follow. And instead, we must learn the way of Christ in being a living sacrifice. And what is this? How does this affect us? When we unlearn our self-centered ways, it means we're unlearning the, the thinking, the feeling, and the actions associated with orienting reality around yourself. That's what it means. And to be uh, learning the way of Christ in being a living sacrifice, that means you're orienting the way you think, the way you process your feelings, and the way that you act around the life of uh, and the holiness of Jesus Christ. There's many similarities between Samson and Jesus. There, there are, but they're all quite structural similarities in their circumstances and their stories. For example, both Samson and Jesus were born uh, through miraculous births, right? Samson's mother was barren. Jesus' mother, Aunt Mary, was a, was a virgin. Right? Both of these were miraculous births. They were also both um, announced in advance by angels. Right? Samson's birth was announced by an angel to Samson's parents. Same, likewise with Jesus' birth. Uh, both were called to be leaders of Israel. Right? They were called to be holy. Right? Samson had this Nazarene uh, vow that he was uh, called to. Jesus was called to very, very specific things to fulfill the prophecy as being the Messiah. They both were set apart for specific purposes by God. Both died sacrificial deaths, you, you can say. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But both died in a manner that was victorious in God's purposes. So some people who read uh, Judges as Christians sometimes make the wrong assumption that Samson is, is kind of this, this, uh, this type of Christ, that he's kind of representing a, a version of Christ in the Old Testament. But I actually think the better way to think about it is that Samson is, is a contrasting example of Christ. That even though many of their circumstances were similar, both of them also came as as redeemers or were called to be judges and saviors of Israel while they were being oppressed by others, their examples, their lives, the, the, the things that they accomplished, the fruit that they bore couldn't be any different. So it is helpful to think about Jesus' example and Samson's example when we read his story because we can see that Samson's a perfect example of what we don't want to see in a hero in a savior, in a leader of God's people, in, a, in someone who's chosen by God. Whereas, on the other hand, Jesus is everything we want and more. Let's take a quick look at Samson's character as we see in, in today's passage. First, we can see that Samson is, is uh, driven by self-gratification. Right, if you've been reading along in the Daily Devos, you see that this woman being introduced in the story, Delilah, this isn't Samson's first woman that he had romantic relations with. It's, the, it's actually uh, the third. Samson had a wife. His first wife the, the, was, was a Philistine woman. He wanted her. His, his parents knew God, didn't want Samson to marry uh, someone outside of the Israelite people. It was something that is part of the law of Moses. Yet Samson saw what was right in his own eyes, and he went and married her. She ended up dying, her and her father. And then right before the story, he goes after another Philistine woman. Not for marriage this time, but just for sensual relations. And that's it. And then we see him again going after this woman, Delilah, falling in love with her. 
He had no regard for God's word. He had no regard for what God may have wanted for his life in regards to his relationships. He totally disregards his parents' godly advice. And ultimately, he does what is right in his own eyes. And we can see that this this self-centeredness, this self-gratification of Samson had a lot to do with this temptation of his flesh, of his sinful flesh. Crazy about today's passage with Samson and Delilah. He's in love with this woman who is out to destroy him, actually, And she makes this abundantly clear from the beginning. Abundantly clear. In verse 6, Delilah says to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies, how you might be bound, that one can subdue you. She's not even hiding her intentions here. But Samson is so blinded and arrogant and driven by his own desire for Delilah that he not only maintains a relationship with her, but he continues to put himself in positions of vulnerability. Albeit, he thought he was clever. But you can see that with the three times that Delilah tries, each time he gets closer and closer to the truth. At the end, he, he reveals, a razor has never come to my head in verse 17. But if you look at the instance before that, he already starts to allude to the fact that it has something to do with his hair. Even though Delilah's intentions for the destruction of Samson are abundantly clear from the beginning, Samson seems to have some sort of twisted gratification and satisfaction by continuing to have a relationship with her. He seems to have some irrational addiction to risk and danger. But ultimately, it seems like these instances were ultimately feeding his ego, making him feel good about himself, about outsmarting Delilah, making her look like a fool, and also being able to break through the bondage every time. Maybe he thought that every time he would break away from one of these attempts, that Delilah would be more and more impressed Who knows what the reasons are, but we know that there was no good reason for Samson to maintain this relationship with Delilah. Samson's prominent trait was selfishness, self-centeredness, arrogance. And because of this, you can see that the only way this story could happen is if Samson was a fool or if he was blind. Well, actually, it's because of his self-centeredness that he was both. He had blinded himself to the danger, not only that Delilah presented, but the dangers of violating God. Samson was blind spiritually far before he was ever blind physically. And oftentimes you'll see this in the Bible, where a spiritual reality becomes a physical one. You see that God who's ordaining all of this to happen, who had chosen Samson from the beginning, none of this is coming as a surprise to him, allows Samson to be humiliated in a very specific way. What happens? His eyes get gouged out. It's quite a grotesque image, but really it's intentional on God's part to show that Samson had been blind this whole time because of his self-centeredness. See, Samson wasn't like any of the other judges. Keep in mind, he's the worst one. With Samson, we don't see God raising up any other judges in the book. But unlike the other judges, Samson never does anything for the Israelites. All of the other judges, when they were oppressed by another nation, when Israel was being oppressed by the Philistines or by the Midianites or whatever, what did they do? They were raised up by God as a judge and they used their position of power. They used the strength that God had bestowed on them for what? To deliver the people of Israel. But throughout the whole Samson narrative, although he he has way more verses committed to him than many of the other judges, 
you don't see him doing anything for anyone other than himself. Even when he fights the Philistines and he defeats them in different occasions, it's never to save another Israelite. It's never to earn God honor. It's purely because they got in his way. Samson never, to, even, to the, even to his point of death, right? Even when he dies and he destroys the temple of Dagon and over 3,000 Philistines are killed and, and the god of Dagon is, is, is shown to be a false idol and defeated by Yahweh, he doesn't even do that for God or for Israel. Look at verse 28. When Samson is finally praying genuine prayers to God, this is what he says, O oh Lord God, Please remember me and strengthen me this only this once that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. Isn't that incredible? That after all he's been through, even though he was humbled by God, his reason for wanting to destroy the Philistines had nothing to do with anyone else. It had to do with the eyes that were taken from him. Here we see Someone who was so self-centered and it was so ingrained in him that he was unable to see even after he was humbled by God. Because of his blindness, he was enslaved and put into bondage by Delilah who figured out a very simple thing. She couldn't get Samson to tell, tell uh, his secret until she figured out. If I, make Sam, if I question Samson's love for me, that'll put him over the edge. That'll make him open up. It'll be enough for him to cave. This shows the kind of bondage that Samson's self-centeredness ultimately led him to. He was bound by a desire to prove his love for Delilah. And he never felt that we never see any evidence of him being bound by a desire to express his love for God. But yet when this woman Delilah, a deceiver, and up to no good and has made it abundantly clear, questions Samson's love for her, he takes it upon himself to prove how much he loves her by revealing a secret that would ultimately be his demise. Samson resembles self-centeredness, but yet he was chosen by God. And that is a confusing thing. It's a, it's a hard pill to swallow at times. But before we just jump into criticizing Samson, here's another harsh reality we must accept. That Samson resembles the tragic reality of many Christians today. That although we have been called by God, although we have been given power and freedom to overcome sin and the enemies of God, to live holy lives, even though we've been given these specific spiritual privileges and blessings, many Christians today still live lives that look a lot like Samson's life. We know what it means to be a Christian. We know what it means in terms of how it should affect the way we live our lives. That We know that we're called by God and because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross and through resurrection, we know that we've been given the free gift of eternal life. We know all these things. However, we as Christians oftentimes will live willingly blind lives towards God and His Word. We will willingly live self-directed, self-centered lives in our own pursuits rather than seeking and pursuing the will and purpose of God. Look at Samson once again, thinking he did what was right in his own eyes, feeling he let his emotions lead him and dictate his behavior, and ultimately he kept the commands of God that he thought were good for him, right? Right? Because in his conversation with Delilah, we realize that he is fully aware of where his strength comes from, that it comes from God. And it comes because he's been chosen by God to 
be a Nazarite to never cut his hair. He is fully aware of this. This is the first time we realize this in the story. So you see that Samson was obedient in never cutting his hair and never drinking anything from the grapevine. Why? Because he knew that if he did that, his strength would be taken away from him. So because he knew it would benefit him, he did what? He obeyed those parts. But when it came to everything else that God had commanded, he threw those commands out the window. Samson disobeyed, and his actions ultimately show mistake after mistake after mistake, that his thinking was totally self-centered, only benefiting himself. This is why Samson's story is such a tragic one. Because it shows how far the Israelites had departed from God's word. It showed how distant they were from God's will. Because in the stories of the judges, God picks the cream of the crop. God picks the the best of what what is available from the Israelites. And in the case of Samson, there was no one worthy. So he had to call Samson's parents to raise him up in a totally separate manner. So Samson was the best that Israel had. What does that say about Israel? What does that say about Israel? They were so much more depraved. Nevertheless, God glorifies himself through Samson's story. The Philistines, they mistakenly give credit to their God, Dagon, multiple times in verse 23 and 24. But God shows that it was not Dagon, it was not Philistines, it was not Delilah ultimately that brought Samson into the temple in that day, but it was God's will to humble Samson and to punish the Philistines for their idolatry and insolence. As tragic as Samson's story is, we see a lot of this today from those who also should be the people of God. As Christians, we have been grafted into God's family. Through Christ, we've been extended grace. We've been given new identity as children of God. And many of us love to obey the things of God that are for our benefit, like going to heaven. What do we need to do? We need to repent. You want forgiveness of sins? What do you have to do? You have to repent. You have to pray. You have to trust in God. But we throw a lot of other things out the window will show that we aren't truly living out what we are called to be in Christ. I share a little bit about the worldview survey, but I want to share with you a little bit uh, more today, specifically about what the worldview survey shows us about people who identify as Christians. People who ought to be examples of God's holiness to be resembling Christ. According to the survey that was conducted in the U.S., 71% of adults in the U.S. identify as Christian. 71%. That's a lot. But only 51% believe that of these 71%, only 51, that's that's just over half, only half of them believe that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect, and righteous creator of the universe who still rules today. Only half believe in that of people who call themselves Christian. In addition to that, of those half that believe that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfect, and righteous creator who you rules today, only 45% of those people believe that you can possess certainty about God. They actually believe that it is impossible to have certainty about God. And of that 51%, only 34% believe that God is involved in their lives today. The problem is that people who claim to believe in God have fundamentally flawed views of God's nature and relationship with reality. Among those who call themselves Christian, When asked, what is the universal common purpose or ultimate reason for living, for human life? Only 18% selected the answer, knowing, loving, and serving God. Only 18%. 
Now there's different kinds of categories of Christian that were identified in this survey. One is uh, mainline Protestant churches like the United Methodists, Presbyterian Church of the U.S., Church of Disciples of Christ Church, Episcopal Church. These are mainline and, and Lutheran. There's Catholic, there's Pentecostal, and there's Evangelicals. And Evangelicals tend to have the highest coherence with biblical worldview. But even amongst Evangelicals, 52% who identified as Evangelical, 52% of them believe that there's no absolute truth. 75% of Evangelicals believe that people are basically good. 48% believe that a person who is good enough or does enough good works can earn eternal salvation. 43% of evangelicals believe that Jesus sinned while he was on earth. 62% say it's more important to have any kind of faith. It doesn't need to be Christianity than it is to align specifically with the Christian faith. 42% seek primary moral guidance from sources other than the Bible. 40% do not believe that human life is sacred. 40% accept that lying is morally acceptable if it advances a person's interests and protects one's reputation. 34% reject the idea of legitimate marriage as being between one man and one woman. And last but not least, the one I want to share with you that might be the answer to the whole thing. 61% of evangelicals do not read their Bibles daily. Amongst the four Christian groups categorized in this study, evangelicals are supposed to have the highest percentages of biblical worldview, but what I just shared with you is the breakdown of what evangelicals believe. All this goes to say we are living in a time and a culture that is not too different from the period of the judges. That the church, the same way Israel was supposed to represent God's holiness in a land of people who didn't know God. The church is supposed to be that today in America and in every nation that the church is. However, the church is spiraling. And we have departed so far from God's word that it's no wonder that we have Sam, people like Samson of our own ages, like Ravi Zacharias, like Josh Harris, like different Christian celebrities who show different kinds of strength and dominance, but ultimately are brought down by their moral failures. Although we see the similarities between Jesus and Samson in the circumstances, their lives couldn't have been more different. Jesus' character is that he's driven by selfless sacrifice. He wouldn't have left heaven if it wasn't for his perfect grace and intention to give up his life as an offering. This was exactly what the Father's will was. To do what is right in accordance with God's law and his heart behind the law, Jesus fulfilled the law 100% and more. And on top of that, he taught not only the law, but he taught the intentions behind the law. In Matthew 4, we also see how Jesus resisted temptation in contrast to Samson. Various attempts of Satan, ultimately Jesus resists all by clinging to the scriptures and staying steadfast in his purpose and will from the Father. And of course, ultimately Jesus died as a sacrifice for us. And we make a huge deal out of that. We make a huge deal out of Jesus being a dying sacrifice for us. But we must also remember that he lived as a sacrifice for us too. And if he didn't live the perfect holy life, his sacrifice wouldn't have been the holy, perfect sacrifice either. He was fully surrendered to the will of the Father. And this is what characterizes a life that is fully surrendered to God. This is what we must learn as Christians. To live as living sacrifices instead of living self-centered lives. You see, a self-centered life is ultimately a life that desires that everyone else makes sacrifices but me. Whereas a living sacrifice to God has the mindset of, I am willing to sacrifice everything for God because He is at the center. He is the most important thing. 
in my existence. This is what Paul alludes to in his teaching to the Christians in Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What self-centeredness do we cling to in our lives as Christians? When do we live expecting others, including God, to make sacrifices for us, rather than us being ready and humble and willing to make sacrifices for God? Yes, Samson died a glorious death. He was able to be a dying sacrifice, but he was so far from a living one. And we are called to be living sacrifices. That means the, day, the way we live, day by day, moment by moment, should be surrendered to God. Not our desires, not our wants, but God's. We need to be close to His Word to know what His desires and wants are. And we must unlearn these self-centered ways that we've been trained and ingrained in in order to learn the way of Christ and His example. In doing so, we'll realize how impossible and difficult it truly is, which will lead us to greater worship of Christ for His perfection, but it will also grow us in our faith as we rely on the power of the Spirit to actually produce the fruit of thinking, feeling, and acting in accordance with God's will. A self-centered life leads to blindness and bondage, which is a part from what Christ has earned for us on the cross. He has given us vision and freedom. So let's live in the vision and freedom that Christ has given us. Let's unlearn the ways in which we've brought up. Let's, let's ask God to reveal the things that we don't even think about, that we don't even realize we're being self-centered. And let us instead put on the example of Christ and learn His way and how we can be living sacrifices to worship Him, to honor Him, and make Him known for the world. Let's not be like Samson where we're just about ourselves where even our death is just about avenging our two eyes. But let's live in a manner of Christ who is focused on saving the world. And when we live as living sacrifices to Christ, it won't just be a blessing to us, but it will bless everyone else as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we have both examples in the scriptures of Samson and of Christ, the perfect example the perfect Savior, the perfect King, the perfect Judge, Prophet, and Priest. And Lord, we pray, God, that our lives as Christians would not resemble more of Samson's life, but more of your life. We know that this is impossible for us to accomplish on your own. And even as we pray for this context we're in right now and how it's not too far off from the time of the Judges, Lord, we do have the hope of knowing that you have poured out your spirit on mankind, that we as recipients of your spirit, we are not doomed to the same destiny of judges. So Lord, help us to unlearn the things that Satan and the world have taught us over the years without us knowing it. Help us, give us the awareness and the vision to notice and repent and turn away from those crooked ways and help us to learn your way, Lord to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing and acceptable to you. And we pray that we will glorify Christ because in doing so, we will understand how holy and how wonderful he is. We thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus. In him, we have all things. In him, we have freedom. Help us to live as your true people. In Jesus' name, amen.